They Killed Him Dead by L. Ron Hubbard, part two. Motionless on his back, Detective Sergeant Lane lay and stared into the dark. He did not know how long he had been there or where he might be. He realized suddenly that he lay on some sort of operating table. He sat up, feeling the ache of his whole body. He knew that the sound had been going on for some time, but not until now had it forced itself on his attention. It was the low reverberations of a drum, quick but sinister and ominous. It fell barely perceptible on the darkness. Lane listened to it. It called to mind savage rites, grisly cannibalistic feasts. Another sound became recognizable. It was that of human voices. Listening intently, Lane made out the two distinct tones. One was harsh, the other was lifeless and dull. And I'm gone to kill you, Morton. And I'm gone to kill you, Morton. Lane's heartbeat quickened and the muscles of his lean jaw throbbed. Here was something which was understandable. In it, perhaps, he would find the answer to the entire gruesome mystery. He slid off the operating table and stepped in the direction of the sound. It was not until then that he saw the streak of greenish light which came from under a door and through a keyhole. As he moved, the voices became much louder. Ah, time to kill you, Martin! Lane cautiously tried the door and found it locked. He knelt silently and placed his eye at the keyhole. In front of his gaze, naked in the greenish light, was a small table. Lane shifted his eye and saw the lithe individual of past acquaintance. The detective moved again. It was all he could do to repress the gasp of horror which sprang to his lips. There, dressed as he had been that afternoon, was Kramer. Morton's secretary sat staring straight before him with dead, unfocused eyes. The socket seemed lidless and sunken. The entire posture of the body was without resilience. I have come to kill you, Martin. I have come to kill you. Lane stood up and stepped back to hurl his weight against the door. He drew a deep breath, tensed himself for the shock, and the room gradually lit up with the greenish light. I would not do that if I were you, said Luke Guru across the room. The eyes behind the green mask were malevolent, terrifying. The detective glanced at the poised gun in LaRue's hand, looked at the operating table and the rows of instruments, and decided to choose the lesser of two evils. He sprang against the panel. Simultaneously with the lunge, Luke Garou sprang across the room, gun butt on high. Before Lane could whirl, the cold steel had arced down in a deadly shimmer of light. Lane sagged limply and then sprawled out at full length. In an instant, the detective lay once more on the operating table. Luke Garou's hands moved nervously and Lane was securely lashed to the white surface. The door which Luke Garou had used was opened and Don Drayden stepped into the room. Going to carry it out, LaRue? I don't know. I'll kill him first and decide on that later. Prepare the slow-acting poison, will you? LaRue picked up a basin of water and threw it forcefully over Terry's face. That ought to bring the fool around. That is, if you can ever wake up a flatfoot. She was busy at a side table with a nickel-plated syringe. Lane came too quickly and tried to rise. He sank back when he felt the weight of the ropes and gave Luke Garou a fixed stare. So you're still here, eh? Why the devil don't you kill me and get it over? You won't have long to wait, Blake. Thanks for the bill. My men just delivered the other mimeograph. Your friend, the chemist, is lying unconscious in an alley. That is, he may be unconscious. Perhaps he is dead. 
lane writhed and then subsided. Poor Kaler. Just because he had been asked to do a favor. I have a little surprise for you. I'm thinking of having you murder Lenny, and perhaps Reynolds. How does that strike you? If you think you can hire me. Oh no. I see you've got me wrong. I meant, well, you saw Kramer in the other room, didn't you? How would you like to be like Kramer? Lane looked wildly about him and caught sight of Dawn Drayton. He gave her an unbelieving stare and then fell back. If you're going to kill me, why don't you? Anxious to meet the devil, aren't you? You will, soon enough. Get that syringe ready, Dawn. Come in the room. See this? It has a poison in it which will take effect in a half hour. He felt of the long, sharp needle. It's not likely that it will fail. It never has. Lane looked fixedly at that hideous nickel barrel and the ugly, sharp point. Just for your interest, everything seems to interest you, Lane. I might add that you'll... Spare me the elocution, LaRue, or Loop Guru, or whatever you call yourself. Get it over with. I might add that your body will be decently and publicly buried. You'll be found murdered on the street in front of headquarters. They'll know you're dead. Three or four days from now, you're coming back to kill Leonard and Reynolds. Know what that means? <laughs> it means the entire force will be panic-stricken. I'll rule the entire city! A reign of terror, understand? <laughs> You're insane, LaRue. You can't get far. You'll be in the chair before the year is out. The detective steeled himself against the shock he knew was about to come. The needle sank into Lane's bared <laughs> arm. Lou's eyes dilated. The plunger was slowly pushed home. Lane felt the budge bulge of fluid underneath his skin. That's that. As much as I'd like to watch you die, I can't. I have business much more important than you. Morton. The green mask turned away. LaRue walked across the room and stepped through the door, holding it open for Dawn Drayden. The girl stepped through without a backward glance. The room was plunged into darkness. And now, we leave you alone in the dark to die. Alone in the dark to die. Terry Lane stared ahead of him, waiting, trying to be calm, trying to retain his reason. He thought about the case, thought it would be a closed chapter to him now. Tonight, Kramer would strangle Morton to death in his home. That he would die was horrible enough in itself, but worse than that, his corpse would walk in death. His hands, cold and clammy, would strangle the life from his chief and his friend. He would become a horror in the city. In view of the past evidence, Lane did not once doubt that this was possible. Then he became conscious of the silence. The silence would mean that Morton was about to die. Morton, to whom he had talked that afternoon. Some way, somehow, he must get free. And then he sickened as he realized that his remaining minutes of life were few. Then that nickel-plated syringe. The door clicked and swung open stealthily. Lane tried to look in that direction, but could not. Blackness was still about him. Then the icy white beam of a flashlight bit into his eyes, blinding him. Lane moaned. They were about to torture him further. Don Drayden's voice came to him. Lie still. You'll be free in an instant. Her fingers were working at his bonds. What's the use? Plenty of use. You're not dead. There was nothing but water in that syringe. I put it there myself. You mean it? Of course I mean it. But hope lagged as Lane realized that this must be just another ruse. Why are you doing this for me? Her 
face came into the light. Her eyes were hard. I have reasons of my own. Reasons that have been driving me on from the first. I can't tell you now. There isn't any time. I'm risking my life now as it is. But if LaRue ever learns that I have helped you, then I put water in that syringe. But let's not think of that. I haven't got a gun for you. You've got to get out of here on your own. Why are you doing all of this for me? Because I want Dr. LaRue caught. I hate him. He's a fiend. A murderer. No gun. A drum beating in the distance. A fiend still in his path. But for the moment, Terry Lane was free. He didn't consider the odds. He was in debt to the girl. And he would have to try and repay it by getting out of this place alive. The detective strode forward into action. Steps were before him and he ran quickly down. As he plunged down the dim corridor, a phrase ran through the detective's mind. I have come to kill you, Morton. Some way he must stop that murder. A door presented itself and without pausing, Lane kicked it open. The mad whirling strains of a jazz band hit him full in the face. He stopped and looked ahead to realize that he stood in the wings of the stage. This, then, had been the source of the drum. There was nothing ominous about a jazz band. He was in the club Haitian. The detective ran swiftly to the entrance, glanced through the door, raced out into the street. A cab was cruising past at low speed, and Lane ran for it. Morton residents, step on the driver gave Lane a wild-eyed stare and then stepped all the way down on the accelerator. The toneless phrase rang incessantly in the detective's ears as he watched the streetlights whip past. I have come to kill you, Martin. One scene was before him, the unfocused eyes of the dead Kramer. Lights from the Morton residence glowed harshly through the blackness. Cold stone steps were under his feet and he ascended them two at a time. In spite of himself, he could not evade the hand of fear that clutched at him. A premonition came over him that he was too late. No, not too late. A hideous scream blasted the silence of the night. The front door was open. Lane sprinted into the deserted hallway. Another scream came from the top of the stairs. It was a race against death. Up there, Kramer, the detective thudded up the carpeted flight and whirled to face the room on his left. He saw the back of a man, the back of a coat from the grave. Kramer was slowly approaching the bed where Morton cowered with terror-stricken eyes. Lane rushed forward, stepped into the room to be savagely clutched from behind. He tried to wrench himself free, but the arms held fast. Some invisible person was holding him powerless. Kramer was plodding machine-like toward the bed, hands clutching out before him. Morton's palms were held out, supplicating, pitiful. Don't! Don't come near me! You're dead, man! Get away from me! Kramer did not seem to hear. His steps were relentless, leaden. His sunken eyes bored unseeing before him. His face was putty-like in death. The hands were clenching and unclenching hungrily. Morton was sobbing, racked with terror. Kramer! Kramer! I am come to kill you, Lord. The convulsing hand stabbed forward. Claw-like fingers met about Morton's throat. The banker was jerked to the floor. Kramer slowly pressed the body down. The dead man's eyes were glassy, terrifying, without expression. Seconds lagged by. Then the murderer dropped Morton and stood up, carefully turning toward the door. Morton's head rolled. Lane kicked viciously, furiously back with his heels at the shins of his captor. He knew that something would happen in a moment. 
The arms came away from him suddenly and whipped him around. Lane was sent spinning over against the wall. Flames spat at him from his captor's gun. A slug whined away from the plaster. The detective gained his balance and darted to one side. Lane leaped to the stairs and went down four at a time. Between two fires, the detective jumped into the living room and turned to send a shot into the ranks of his attackers. The gun clicked empty. A moment later, he found himself out of the house and running through the backyard. Bullets kicked into the turf about him. He vaulted a fence, lit running, and made for the nearest telephone, even though he knew that the house would be deserted before the police could arrive. That is, deserted, except for the body of Morton, killed by the dead hands of Kramer. Back at headquarters, Lane's chief detective said, Yeah, it's fantastic. Fantastic, weird, and ridiculous. If I didn't know you better, Lane, I'd say you were lying. You'd think I was lying if I suddenly walked up and choked you to death? Huh. What are you trying to do, scare me? No, but you wouldn't be so doubtful if my dead body walked into your office. Bah. How about it, Reynolds? Reynolds took his pipe out of his mouth and put his feet down on the floor. Absently, he tapped the pipe against the gleaming emerald on his finger. All I can say is, I pronounced Kramer dead. He looked like he'd stay that way, too. Even had an embalming scission on his chest. Lane's men got his fingerprints and found them again on Morton's throat. When I say a man is dead, He's dead. Yes, he's dead. But how do you account for Kramer's coming back then? Ah, you're, you're both full of hop. I, I won't believe dead men walk until I see it with my own eyes. It's just the old hocus pocus. Look, I, I've got records right now which state that over $2 million have been extorted from prominent men in this city during the last week. You know, if you let this thing keep up, this Dr. LaRue will own the whole damn town. You're right about that. I've traced every possible lead and there's no answer. The thing's driving me crazy. Say, Reynolds, you've been Haiti. Dig up all the dope you can on zombies for me, will you? The jangle of the phone interrupted them. Hello? You know who? No, I don't. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, I guess I'm kind of upset. It was enough to upset anybody at that. Where? Across the street from... I get you. 7.30 tonight. I'll be there. You bet I will. Gentlemen, Luke Guru is going to be in the bullpen no later than 10 tonight. Well, if he isn't, you can turn in that shiny badge. And I mean it. And if he is... I'll turn it in anyway for lieutenancy. As per Don Drayden's orders, Detective Sergeant Terry Lane stood across from Galt's undertaking parlor at 7.30 sharp. He was alone in accordance with the girl's request. An arm touched him lightly on the shoulder, and he whirled to see Dawn's beautiful face beside him. She was pale, and worry lurked in her blue eyes, but she gave him a reassuring smile. This isn't any trap, and with a little luck, we'll be able to wipe the slate clean. LaRue is coming to Galt's tonight. Yes, he is coming with a dead man at eight o'clock. We'll have to be on hand before that time, if we expect to connect. All right. The fireworks can't start too soon to suit me. The detective reached up and gave the window a tug. It responded and slid silently open. He boosted himself up and crawled inside. The odor which greeted him was far from pleasant. He reached down for the girl's hands and pulled her up and into the room. Now, we'll sit down and wait for our friend. We'd better hide ourselves. It's almost eight. What's better than a coffin? Lord knows there's enough of them around here. 
I know it's gruesome, but that can't be helped. It's the last place to look. I hope so. Let's use the ones that are standing up. I couldn't stand the thought of lying in one. All right. Don't worry. I'll be right beside you. He closed down the lid. The detective looked about him and then chose a casket which leaned against the wall in the shadows. He stepped inside and closed the lid upon himself. Through the glass window, he could command the room with his eyes, if not his gun. The entrance door was opening slowly, and in an instant, there appeared Loop Garou, dragging a corpse. Galt, the undertaker, the maniac's henchman, and Dr. LaRue passed through the outer room of the building and approached the embalming chamber. Come on, let's put this thing on the table and get to work. He again snatched at the dead body they bore between them. Roughly, they threw the corpse on the white table of the embalming chamber. From within the coffin, Lane grimly laid out his plan of action. He did not know the identity of the dead man, but he correctly supposed that it was a cog in another murder extortion scheme. He was half-minded to attack the two waiting men, but stifled the impulse. He would wait until Loop Guru had finished his unknown task. With the brakes, Lane thought, he could control the situation with a minimum of rough work. And then it suddenly became apparent that the brakes were not to be with him that night. The bottom of the coffin was sliding gradually out from the wall. There was no mystery in it. The casket had been tilted back and the added weight had caused it to slide out at the base. Lane braced himself for action. The only course left to him would lie in a sudden attack at that very moment. He thrust out the lid with a sudden jerk. It was this movement which caused his immediate undoing. With a dull scrape, the box crashed down. Lane was flat on his back, helpless. The henchman leaped to his feet and ran across the room, gun in hand. As he had seen the fall of the coffin, he lost no time in search. The detective thrust up the lid and tried to leap out. Death roared at him and a bullet shattered the casket's glass. Lane rolled out and brought his own gun to the side. The light wing jumped aside and fired again. The detective gained his feet and rushed forward, gun up and ready. A flash of powder sprayed lead across his upper arm. Galt coolly aimed and shot from across the room. Lane felt the sear of the bullet above his temple. A gush of blood ran down into his eyes, blinding him. Lane was beset on three sides and he did the only thing he could do. He backed up quickly and threw himself under the cover of the coffin he had so lately quit. Angrily, without feeling the pain of his wound, he brushed the blood out of his eyes. He saw that there was little hope of his getting out alive and saving Dawn Drayden. Galt saw Lane's gun come up over the coffin rim. He sent a bullet toward Lane's hand. The detective's gun shot away from him. Weaponless, the detective jumped to his feet, ready for the shock of bullets. Galt was upon him with a clubbed gun. Lane saw a gun crash down toward his forehead. Light exploded within his brain. He slumped dizzily, utterly limp. Luke Guru kicked his body for good measure. Throw him into one of those coffins. We'll dispose of him quick enough. Cold air brought Lane back to consciousness. Cold air and the jolting he was receiving inside the coffin. In spite of the padded sides of the box, each time it jarred, Lane was nauseated with pain. For the briefest space of time, he wondered where he was. And then he knew. The detective was in the back of a hearse. Admittedly, Terry Lane was afraid, but then it is said that only brave men can know fear. He clearly understood his position, but characteristically, he set his brain to work to devise a method of escape from a seemingly hopeless position. The thought of being buried alive was not a pleasant one. Cautiously, Lane lifted his head and looked upside down toward the driver's seat. By the light on the machine's dash, he could see the silhouettes of two men. He could hear the conversation of the men in front, and he listened absently. Where did you put the girl? In back of the elevator. She'll be safe there until I can blast her down. A brittle silence ensued, punctuated only by the jar of the rocketing machine. Experimentally, Lane reached out and touched the side of the hearse. His groping fingers encountered the metal rail along the side, and he gripped it. While he still gripped the rail, the car lurched and the casket shifted. Lane grunted and pulled again. 
Once more, the box lifted and scraped against the floor. The plan was only half thought out, but the detective persisted in his efforts. Slowly but certainly, the coffin was sliding down toward the back of the hearse. For some unknown reason, his captors had not strapped the thing in place. The shock of bumps was repeated over and over, and Lane valiantly worked each lurch to his own advantage. The hearse shot up the approach of a bridge, careening under the impetus of the bump at the start. Lane's coffin struck the doors at the back. The machine swooped down the incline and once more hit the rough road at a faster pace. Something gave way at the bottom of the casket. It tipped crazily and then teetered on the edge. Lane braced himself and drew in his arm, ready for the shock. Empty air snatched at the box. The edge hit the dirt with a scraping crunch. Lane was dazed by the impact of what resulted in his freedom. He lay at the side of the road, still confined by the casket, but free. Unable immediately to free himself, Lane took the next best course. He thrust his arm out and began to hitch his narrow prison off the road. He knew that he would soon be missed, and he did not intend to be picked up if he could help it. The life of Don Drayden depended solely upon him. Even with that bare clue in the back of the elevator to work upon, Lane knew that he would exert every faculty to effect the girl's deliverance. He didn't think of it as a heroic gesture on his part. To him, the rescue was a necessity far more important than his own well-being. Up on its side, flat on its face, over on top, slammed back to the bottom, rolled the casket, and within the next minute, Lane was securely hidden in tall grass and shrubs. They would naturally look for the box in the road. Lane prayed for any kind of break. Lane reached feverishly for the latch. Certainly, there must be some way out of this prison. But once more, his efforts met with complete failure. Footfalls were nearing, and Lane lay very still, debating the wisdom of crying out. The crunch, crunch of heavy leather shoes on gravel came closer. Lane mustered all his nerve. Hey, you in the road. Hey, you in the road. Who's that? Detective Sergeant Lane. I'm down here in the grass. Don't be scared. A long pause greeted this statement. Then the footsteps began again, and the stranger came over the highway. My God! Don't stand there like a nut. Get me out of here. Terror was visibly gripping the woman, for she stood with a flashlight on the coffin for the better part of a minute. Then she evidently bolstered up her nerve and stepped closer. Loosen the lock on this thing. If I don't get out of here, I'll have a reason for the box. White faced, the stranger did his bidding and lifted up the heavy lid. Cold air flooded over the detective's body as he sat up. <sighs> wow. I never thought I was going to get out. Well, how? Never mind how. If you come around to the station next week, I'll give you half my paycheck. Right now, I'm in a hurry. Thanks. He called over his shoulder but the stranger stood stunned beside the casket as though still afraid to believe her eyes. Despite the gaping drugstore clerk and the three customers who stood about in shocked attitudes, Lane dashed to the back of the store where an array of telephone booths stood ready for prospective callers. Police headquarters. He snapped into the mouthpiece. Leonard's acid voice answered him presently. Listen, Chief, I've got a hot lead. Hot lead? I thought you were going to bring in LaRue. Give me time. I want you to cover Galt's parlor. Cover the place with about 10 men. Get me? Arrest everybody that even looks at it. Sure. And what are you going to do? Pick daisies? Say. I came so close to pushing those things up that I'm still shivering. I'm going to cable Haiti for one thing. And I'm going to get a list of every person in town connected with Haiti. If you want me in the next hour, call the coroner's apartment. He promised to get some dope on Haiti for me. He called up a few minutes ago. Wanted to know where you were. He wanted to talk to you. Okay. I'll be seeing you before midnight. The druggist shrank back from the counter and stared at the detective with unbelieving eyes. Lane flashed his badge. Fix me up, will you? Upon the presentation of authority, the druggist quickly led the detective into the back. 
looks as if you've had a tough night, Lieutenant. <laughs> not Lieutenant. That is, not yet. He glanced at himself in the mirror over the wash basin. Then the clue to Dawn's whereabouts flashed through his mind and his lips grew tight. Snap it up, will you? With iodine still burning in the wounds and with his right arm in a white sling, Lane again surveyed himself in the glass. He noticed the scratch he had received when LaRue had struck his face. It was a minute thing and had long ago stopped bleeding. Nevertheless, Lane gasped as he touched it. He leaned closer to the glass and stared. A low whistle escaped him. Boy, am I dumb. And then to the druggist. Thanks, I'll remember this. And if you ever see that scratch, well, if it hadn't been for your forgetting to tie it up, I'd be in a devil of a fix. And he left the druggist gaping with surprise. Lane flashed his badge to the cab driver at the curb. Van Metten Apartments and let it rip. Within five minutes, they were before the lavish entrance. Lane paid the white-eyed driver and sped into the building. The girl of the switchboard was waved aside and Lane sprinted for the automatic elevator. He pressed a button and shot up nine flights to the apartment of Dr. Charles Reynolds. The coroner's apartment covered the entire floor. Reynolds himself greeted Lane. Hello, Terry. I've been digging up that information for you. Tried to reach you at headquarters, but you aren't there. I've been busy. Listen, Doc, I want you to compose a cable for me and then get a hold of all the connecting links this town has with Haiti. Reynolds nodded. He led Lane into the library and waved him to a chair. Wow, nice place you got here. Yes, I like it. Fortunately, I have a private income, or I couldn't keep it going. Anybody tagging you? I don't know, Doc. This Luke Guru has a habit of turning up every place. I wouldn't want him wished on me. By the way, I have been reading up on the subject as you asked me to do. There really are such things in Hades as zombies, living dead men. At least, they claim to have seen them there. The authors of the book I've read, I mean. Speaking of books, you've certainly got enough of them. Any of them deal with Haiti? Of course, several. That's where I dug up the information for you. Have a look yourself if you want to. Yeah, first, I wish you'd compose a cable for me in French to that pharmacy. Lane twitched his right arm, suddenly remembering that it was in a sling. He reached into his pocket with his left hand and brought forth a slip of paper. I jotted the address down on this. He handed the slip of paper to Reynolds. The coroner glanced at it. Just ask for a complete description of Dr. LaRue, will you? If you will, we ought to have an answer in the morning. And there's something else. Compile a list of all the people you know in this town who've con connected with Haiti. Certainly. Glad to help you with this. Now. You'll excuse me, I'll go into my study and fix up both jobs for you. It's my office, and I have all the cable blanks there. Browse through the books if you'd like. He walked to the doorway and then turned around. His scarf pin caught the light and hurled it back, and the emerald ring glowed softly. Unconsciously, he adjusted the scarf pin. Lane watched him disappear and then got to his feet and walked over to the shelf. He reached up and extracted three volumes. The first was called Voodooism. The second was merely entitled Haiti. The third was the Code Penal of the Republic of Haiti. Quite naturally, since he was an investigator of crime, Detective Sergeant Lane opened the third one first. Through force of habit, he sat with his face toward the door. Article 249 leered blackly at him from the printed page. Article 249 also shall be qualified as attempted murder. The creak of a door interrupted him. He glanced up and stiffened. A gasp of horror escaped him. He jumped to his feet, his eyes dilating wildly. Coming toward him in that slow, lifeless shuffle was a blank-eyed corpse.
So silent had been the passage of the walking dead man that Lane had not seen it until it was halfway across the room. A crawling sensation went up and down Lane's spine, and for an instant, he was held immovable by the terrible sight. He knew now the horror which had been Morton's and Gordon's and Vernon's, and as he moved, so moved his attacker. The detective backed away, keeping his eyes on the lifeless face. Sudden resolve caused him to stand his ground. The thing was shuffling faster now, seeming to sense the end. The hand stabbed out for Lane's throat. Like a boxer, Lane ducked. His left hand fist tightened. He carefully measured the distance to the dead man's jaw and swung with all his might. A long blow arced straight to the dead face. It crashed into the clammy flesh. The man swayed a little, but did not move away. The hand shifted and came on. Lane snatched at the wrists, pushed them away. Up came his knees. The vicious jab caught the dead man in the groin. Still, the thing was on its feet. Its strength was horrible. A sob caught in Lane's throat as he realized the hopelessness of the situation. There was not even time to strike back. With the deadly purpose of an automaton, his attacker was forcing him back against the mahogany desk, bending him with the weight and strength of a thing not to be denied. Lane struggled, striving desperately to get rid of the thing's horrible clutch. The cold, clammy hands caught at his throat. He felt them squeezing tighter. His breathing became more difficult. Then, suddenly, through a hazy blackness, half unconscious, he felt those talon-like fingers release their grip as the power of animation seemed suddenly to leave the living dead man. The wilting figure dropped to the floor with a thud to remain there still and motionless. My God, what is that? Cried Dr. Reynolds from the doorway. Why, it's a dead man. Yes. <coughs> Lane breathed, leaning weakly against the desk. A dead man. One of your dead men, Dr. Reynolds. What? You're under arrest, Luke Guru. Under arrest for attempted murder. Murder. Accessory of the fact. You're mad, Lane. Mad, am I? I've got the goods. I've had it ever since I glanced into the drugstore mirror. I wanted you to come out in the open, and you did. It's the chair, Reynolds. The doctor's eyes gleamed fiercely. His hand blurted his side and came up smoking, spitting flame. But Lane was not in its range. He had moved sideways. A round, burning hole appeared in the end of the sling. Dr. Reynolds collapsed, rolled over, tried to bring up his gun. The hole in Lane's sling grew larger. The doctor's gun leaped out of his hand. Now that'll hold you. Where's Don Drayden? You'll never find her. Don't move. I've got you covered. He hitched the sling and then patted out the fire, which is powder flame had started. Anytime I need a cradle for one of my wings. He grinned suddenly and set to work, securely tying the doctor in an overstuffed chair. The detective walked quickly from the apartment and approached the elevator. He stepped inside, leaving the door open. Lane entered the room beyond, holding the sling away from him and covering any possible source of danger with his hidden gun. But he need not have troubled himself, for the room was empty save for the bound and gagged figure of Dawn Drayden. Lane gave her a reassuring smile and then began to work at the knots, which held her gag in place. The girl's eyes were suddenly peaceful. I knew you'd come. I didn't even lose hope when LaRue came for a dead man. The detective released the ropes about the back of the chair and then helped her to her feet. She stood shakily, rubbing her chafed wrists, then, with a small cry, she threw herself into his arms. After a moment, Lane spoke. There's still work to be done. Where's the doctor's laboratory? In, in there, I suppose. I saw a white table when he opened that door. Lane stepped into the second room, stayed there for a moment, and then came back with a wicked-looking syringe. Come with me, Don. I've got Reynolds strapped to a chair out here. Together they went into the library. The corner still writhed, glared about him. But Reynolds glared no longer when he caught sight of the nickel-plated syringe. You wouldn't. You can't. You're an officer of the law. 
That's got nothing to do with it. I'm going to pay out a little justice. If you go to trial, it'll be your word against mine. You, the coroner. Maybe they wouldn't believe me, Reynolds, if I tried to tell them what a feed you really are. You might escape the chair, but you'll never get away from this. He stabbed the flesh with a needle, his thumb on the plunger. Stop! What do you want me to do? Talk. And talk fast. I want him to tell you. That's what I wanted from the first. I hate him. Perhaps you'll understand when I tell you that five years ago, this man, this monster in human form, was in Haiti. He was plotting then, planning to use zombies, living dead men to do his rotten work for him. I was in Haiti with my brother. Jim was weak, easily led. Dr. LaRue, as he called himself then, became friendly with my brother. Then, later, Jim apparently died of a fever. <laughs> Just as the secretaries of these rich men have died. It was not until later that I realized that Dr. LaRue had killed my brother. Good lord. And made him into a zombie? No. He tried, but then he had not learned enough about it. His efforts were not successful. <sighs> Perhaps I should be glad that Jim was one of the victims of Dr. LaRue, who hasn't walked again. But there are others. Perhaps we may still be able to help them if we learn how this loop guru has placed them in their half-dead state. He can help them. That's why I gradually worked my way into his confidence. It wasn't easy for me to do. Hating him. Loathing him. Yet I'd hoped to be able to help the others by pretending to be his aide. To be able eventually to turn him over to the police. I see. You see, I have pretended that I knew nothing of the real cause of my brother's death. But always, he was watching me. The first time you saw me, you said you were going to take me to headquarters. I ducked behind a cab standing at the curb. I didn't dare go with you then, for he'd seen me. I wondered what the deuce had happened to you. Oh, make him talk, or else... Make him one of them. Make him suffer as he has made these men who have been the walking dead. Talk. Lane's thumb pressed on the needle sticking into Reynolds' arm. All right, all right. You'll find the formula in the upper drawer of that desk. The chemicals are in my laboratory. I swear they are. With those, the men can be brought back to normal health. Any doctor can do it. Look and see. It's here. I think he's right. Now then, I want the full particulars. Quick. I learned it in Haiti. There was a certain drug which creates a state of suspended animation for a few hours. Remember, as coroner, I was the one who examined those men and pronounced them dead. Even those who supposedly died of the fever. I knew they weren't dead, because I had given them the drug each time. But they were buried. No, they weren't. Reynolds glanced at the point of the syringe still sticking in his wrist. Only their empty coffins. Galt, the undertaker, was working with me. He arranged that. He was the man at the car with me when you hit me and <laughs> thought you had knocked me out. But you didn't hit as hard as you thought. I got away. Never mind that part of it now. What made those men into zombies? A second drug which affected their brains. Left the men in a semi-hypnotic state. They have no will of their own, but will carry out any given order. Where did you get these drugs? They were in Papaloi, a voodoo priest who owns a drugstore in Port-au-Prince. I stayed with him and he liked me. He swore me to secrecy and taught me how to mix and use those drugs. 
That's why I was so anxious to get that pharmacist bill. I had my men knock Dr. Kaler out after I thought I saw you give him bill that I dropped when I was examining Gordon. I was looking for it when I came back for my gloves. And you left those notes written in green ink for me, of course. Yes, Kayla had a photostatic copy of the bill, but that was no good to me. I had to get the original before you wired Port-au-Prince and got my description. Just what I thought. That's why I came here and asked you to get that description of Dr. LaRue for me. I thought you would come out into the open then, and you did, by sending one of your living dead to kill me. Dawn looked at the detective and then shuddered as she gazed at the still figure on the floor. How about this man? What stopped him when he tried to kill me? I hurried, failed to give him enough of the drug. He isn't dead, just in a state of suspended animation. There is an antidote that will bring him back fully to normal life. The phone rang, and Lane answered it. It was Chief Leonard calling. You say you've got Galt and three others? Now, come up to Reynolds' apartment and get Loop Guru. Yes, Loop Guru. Better bring some men with you. Who, the coroner? Lane smiled grimly at the bound figure in the chair. Yeah. Yes, Reynolds is here. Lane put down the phone. He picked up one of the books from the table and swiftly turned the pages. Then, half aloud, he read... <clears throat> Article 249. Also shall be qualified as attempted murder, the employment which may be made against any person of substances which without causing actual death, produce a lethargic coma more or less prolonged. If, after the administration of such substances, the person has been buried, the act will be considered murder, no matter what result follows. There are zombies in Haiti. I've seen them working the fields at night. Lord, I'd certainly hate to be a detective there. He glanced down at the ring on Reynolds' hand. You got that ring in Haiti? Yes. The coroner looked at the emerald. Well, you certainly slipped up in wearing it. It left a print on my jaw. See? That's a print of the green serpent. You left your seal on me, Luke Guru. Then that's how you knew? Why didn't you arrest me sooner? I thought I might have to kill you. And I wanted the information about the living dead men first. He lifted his head as he heard the wail of a siren in the street. That's Chief Leonard and his men. <laughs> My job is over. No, no, not quite. Where are the dead men? Lane moved closer to Reynolds, a syringe in his hand. In the back of my laboratory. I have them chained there. For God's sakes, be careful with that syringe. <laughs> Oh, that? It's filled with water. I took the tip from Dawn here. She did the same for me. That's why I'm not one of your walking dead men right now. Leonard, Dr. Kaler with his head bandaged, and a number of uniformed men burst out of the elevator and charged into the library. Where's Loop Guru? And what's Reynolds doing tied up like that? There's Loop Guru, the elusive... Dr. LaRue. What? Why, that's impossible. He's admitted everything. It required a man of with medical knowledge. Right, doctor. There's a list of drugs here on this paper. You'll find those living dead men all chained in Reynolds' laboratory in back of the elevator. You can mix up the works. They'll come back to life in a hurry. Interesting. I always did want to know that formula. All right, Lane, I'll get to work at once. I'd sure hate to be a detective in Haiti. They are nicer here.